well, we all know very well that uh, we have now a so-called new security reality, which is, to my mind, uh, not new at all. It is a security reality which existed uh, during long, long, long centuries. But a couple of decades before, we thought that maybe this is more or less over. Uh, maybe we now have to focus upon the so-called new challenges, the new security threats and risks, uh, such as terrorism, a pandemia, uh, cyber war, of course. And now we realize that the original old concept of security returned, if you want to put it that way, history is back now uh, with us. Which does not mean that the so-called new, uh, so-called emerging security risks are no longer there. So that's why the picture is much more complex. That's why there is much more uncertainty, much more complexity, much more unpredictability uh, in the world. Some people say there is now a growing entropy. There is an American citizen, in fact, a double citizen with a very typical Anglo-Saxon name, Csikszent Mihály Mihály, who wrote a very good book about uh, the competition between entropy and harmony. Uh, so he, in a way, forecast uh, the present uh, situation. Now, of course, uh, there are no uh, uh, threats, as I said, uh, but these are all mixed now with, uh, with the so-called old ones. Uh, that's why some people uh, speak now about the hybrid war, which is just one phenomenon uh, of this uh, general procedure. Cyber war, of course, uh, is also a, 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 a big threat which we cannot really uh, analyze and calculate uh, uh, yet. Uh, this whole uh, cyber crime, cyber war story is part of a, of, a, of a larger revolution, which is called the information revolution. And uh, there is still an ongoing discussion whether this is good or bad. Uh, this uh, has been sleeping uh, in the back of the mankind's mind for thousands and hundreds of years, but nobody knew, and still we perhaps do not know whether this was a sleeping beauty or it was a sleeping monster. Now, uh, of course, if it is a monster, there uh, has to be a reaction to it, and that's exactly uh, what uh, Sandy uh, Vesbo will uh, tell you about, uh, among uh, uh, other things. So we have to react, we have to respond. But I recall that for about, I don't know how many years, also in the framework of NATO, we have always been saying that, okay, we are perhaps too much reactive, we should be much more proactive, and this is exactly what perhaps is missing still, uh, because we couldn't really foresee uh, the situation which uh, was brought about by the invasion of a sovereign European nation by another nation, which, is, which happens to be a nuclear superpower. So, all that, of course, will be discussed uh, uh, this afternoon as well. You might also discuss uh, about the priorities of the risks, whether this is coming from the south, whether this is coming from the east, whether we it is going to come from, from the north. We do not know it yet. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's not or, it's basically end, so it is south and uh, east, and that's why uh, reactions of NATO will have to be uh, prepared in both directions. Just last word, what is needed, it's very simple. Uh, everybody knows it. Uh, we have been talking about for years and years. Uh, first, more unity unity of NATO and unity uh, within the European Union. So, uh, cooperation uh, between NATO and uh, uh, European Union should be qualitatively enhanced. Uh, we know uh, it's needed. We also made some efforts in this direction. Uh, successes are still limited. So also within that cooperation, the role for the European Union, I believe, uh, should uh, be greatly strengthened and enhanced. Let's see how we can do it. With that note, I would like to uh, wish you a very successful uh, conference, a lively debate. You will have opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh,
from the Deputy Director General. Uh, I'm sure that you will use this opportunity, and he will also use the opportunity uh, to present his ideas on these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jerry Frost for hosting us. Thank you, Janos. It's great to see we were co-conspirators back in uh, the day when he was in his first term as foreign minister, and I was ambassador to NATO. And we were dealing at that time with the Kosovo crisis. But first of all, let me uh, thank the Danube Institute and our own uh, public diplomacy division for organizing today's event and for giving me this opportunity to say a few words. Following a quarter century of peace, uh, the nations of the Euro-Atlantic area are once again under threat from the south and from the east, and we do have to deal with both. To the south, the initial hope of the Arab Spring has turned to dust, with ISIL and other terrorist groups spreading violence across the Middle East and North Africa, fueling sectarian tensions and putting the very existence of the Arab state system at risk. Religious extremism is inspiring terrorism on our own streets, while failed or failing states fuel mass migration across the Mediterranean with tragic consequences. Now, I'll be happy to comment on the uh, challenges from the South uh, during our discussion, but given the very pointed title of this conference, let me focus my opening remarks on the challenge from the East, that is, from Russia. Now, for more than two decades, NATO allies have worked tirelessly to cement a deep and broad partnership with Russia. The alliance set out to build a unique relationship with Russia built on our mutual interest in a Europe whole free and at peace. In the 1990s, uh, we combined our efforts to end the wars in the Balkans with Russian peacekeeping forces serving shoulder to shoulder with NATO in Bosnia and later in Kosovo. With the establishment of the NATO-Russia Council in 2002, we had a groundbreaking forum for political consultation and we worked together effectively on issues ranging from counterterrorism to submarine rescue and civil emergency planning. And just five years ago at our Lisbon summit, NATO and Russian leaders agreed to take uh, the relationship to an even higher level, that of a true strategic partnership to include path-breaking cooperation on ballistic missile defense against common threats. So no other partner has ever been offered uh, a compar comparable relationship nor a similarly comprehensive institutional framework and ambitious agenda. But alas, uh, today we found, find that our relations with Russia are at their lowest point in decades. President Putin's Russia seeks to revise the post-Cold War status quo and redivide Europe into spheres of influence. It has used force to change borders. It has disengaged from mechanisms for transparency and confidence building that were uh, built since Helsinki, and it has brandished its nuclear arsenal in uh, menacing ways. And of course, through propaganda and xenophobic nationalism, it has convinced its own people that NATO seeks regime change and the dismemberment of Russia rather than partnership in addressing common threats. Now, I think that efforts to go back to the days when great powers drew new lines on the map at the expense of smaller states represents a fundamental challenge to our vision of a Europe whole free and at peace. That's simply not the kind of Europe that we can accept 25 years after the end of the Cold War. Sovereign nations must be free to decide their own destiny. We've all worked too hard for too long to achieve a Europe whole free and at peace to accept uh, the return of spheres of influence. That's why the international community uh, has imposed sanctions on Russia and why NATO has suspended our practical cooperation with Moscow. And unless Russia chooses to respect international law and the sovereignty of its neighbors, its international uh, isolation will only grow. So given the range and the severity of threats affecting all 28 allies and many of our close partners, the need for transatlantic cooperation and transatlantic sol solidarity is truly paramount. Now, our response to the pressure exerted in our eastern neighborhood and in the Baltic Sea region has been quick and visible. We've significantly increased our forces on the territory of our eastern allies with more planes in the air, more ships at sea, 
and more boots on the ground on a rotational basis. Allied leaders have also agreed measures to adapt NATO to the long-term changes in the security environment. The Readiness Action Plan, adopted at the Wales Summit in September, a robust response to Russia's actions, and the single largest strengthening of our collective defense since the Cold War is uh, definitely NATO's top priority. The Readiness Action Plan, or the RAP as we call it, includes a range of measures. We're adapting our force posture, reinforcing our intelligence sharing, and streamlining decision making to meet quickly emerging challenges. We are more than doubling the NATO response force to up to 30,000 troops. Its centerpiece is the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force, or the Spearhead Force, with a land brigade of around 5,000 troops, complemented by air, sea, and spe special operations forces. Its lead elements will be ready to move in as little as 48 hours to defend any ally that comes under threat. We're also establishing command and control and logistics units in six Eastern allies to make it easier for NATO forces to deploy rapidly, to support our collective defense planning, and to help coordinate training and exercises. These are called NFIUs, NATO Force Integration Units. We're en enhancing our exercise program in order to increase readiness and ensure that our for forces are properly trained and ready for any possible crisis. Uh, this fall, we'll have an exercise called Trident Juncture, involving more than 20,000 land, air, and maritime forces, which is a good example of the, uh, of the new normal when it comes to exercises. Trident Juncture's main purpose will be to train and test the NATO response force so that it is ready to deploy quickly on real-world operations whenever it is needed. Now, we also recognize the threat posed by hybrid warfare, and we're developing approaches to counter it. And here I believe that we can push the envelope uh, even further than we have thus far, not only building the uh, resilience of NATO and the individual allies against hybrid attacks and adapting our military plans, but also trying to better anticipate potential hybrid threats. So this means uh, improved sharing of intelligence, a better assessment of how potential adversaries, and it's not just Russia that could carry out hybrid warfare, but how potential adversaries could exploit our open societies through disinformation, cyber attacks, covert action, or corruption. And it means developing whole of government approaches to de deter and, if necessary, defend against hybrid attacks. So in short, in light of the uh, negative trends in the security environment, we have to update our strategies across the full range of our capabilities in order to align with the challenges that we face. Now, there's also a political dimension to uh, meeting the challenge from a revisionist Russia. With Moscow seeking to roll back the advances made in Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the transatlantic community needs a comprehensive strategy to bolster the ability of the so-called countries in between to withstand outside pressure and preserve their sovereignty. There's a clear role for NATO here uh, in concert with the European Union and other European organizations, and this was a key topic of our foreign minister's meeting last week in Antalya, Turkey. By our next summit in Warsaw, we need to develop additional ways to support Ukraine and Russia's other neighbors that face similar threats. This should include a much larger effort to help these countries carry out uh, the reforms and to build the institutions that are necessary to bolster their stability and increase their resilience to counter Russian pressure and, and, uh, and potential aggression. NATO's main focus will be uh, on security sector reform, and defense capacity building, which I see as a growth uh, industry for NATO in the coming years. So NATO has a key role to play, but complementary efforts by the European Union to support the political and economic uh, development of our neighbors will be just as important. The two uh, go hand in hand. And in fact, the logic of closer NATO-EU collaboration and, and cooperation, uh, I think, is more compelling than ever before. And this was a prominent theme in last week's foreign minister's meeting, including uh, the session at which uh, 
High Representative Federica Mogherini was present. Uh, there was broad agreement that NATO and the EU need to uh, coordinate their efforts to strengthen the resilience of our own nations, but also of that of our eastern and our southern uh, neighbors. We need to work together to improve our defense capabilities. We need to synchronize our approaches to countering hybrid warfare, to debunking Russian disinformation, and uh, defending our shared democratic values. And we also need to work together to manage crises, to deliver humanitarian relief, and project stability beyond our borders. So uh, this is very much a team effort. Uh, the European Council on Security and Defense that will take place next month, and then our Warsaw Summit, uh, middle of next year, will be important opportunities to mark progress in a, this closer synergy that we need between NATO and the EU. Now, real progress in all the areas that I've mentioned is going to require continued strong political commitment and solidarity among all 28 of the NATO allies. We need to demonstrate that the alliance is committed to meeting and defeating all the different threats to our shared security and to our common values, whether they're coming from the east, from the south, or elsewhere. And we have to show that we're ready and able to act quickly and effectively whenever and wherever needed. We have some excellent recent examples of that kind of solidarity. We have allies from the southern part of the alliance, like France, Italy, and Spain, uh, offering to play a leading role in our new spearhead force. On the other side of the ledger, Estonia has sent troops to the Central African Republic, and I'd like to commend Hungary for its decision to deploy over 100 troops to Iraq to help uh, in building that country's defense capacity. By demonstrating a uh, rock-solid commitment to meeting and defeating all the threats to our shared security and to our common values, and by showing that we're ready and able to act quickly and effectively whenever and wherever uh, needed, we can go a long way to deter the threats that we face. Finally, we have to remember that security doesn't come for free. Uh, strong political commitment must be demonstrated through a strong financial commitment as well. We need to have the right means to protect our people, to keep our nation safe, and to build stability together with other countries. In order to do that, allied governments must meet the defense spending pledge that they made at our NATO summit in Wales last year. To stop the cuts and to gradually increase spending toward the NATO goal of 2% of GDP within a decade, and to devote uh, a higher percentage, uh, at least 20%, of uh, defense spending to equipment and modernization. The days of doing more with less are definitely over. For our continued security, implementing the Readiness Action Plan is vital, but we must go further. We need to make sure that our forces are properly financed, properly resourced, and that they're fully geared, fully trained, and fully exercised for any possible contingency. The speed of our response, the availability of more air and maritime assets, and the ability of our forces to move quickly from one theater to another will all be critical to our effectiveness as an, al as an alliance. And so these military requirements should be high on our Warsaw Summit agenda next summer. And indeed, at the summit, we'll need to consider the next stage of the alliance's military adaptation. Uh, the Readiness Action Plan is just the first critical building block in ensuring NATO's collective defense for the 21st century. In the lead up to uh, Warsaw, we'll need to consider possible further steps, such as adjusting the NATO command structure, which was slimmed down in recent years, or expanding the number of high readiness national headquarters uh, in the NATO force structure in order to meet the additional requirements of collective defense, while at the same time not compromising on our capacity to do crisis management. So these are some of the main challenges uh, and the priorities of NATO's response uh, as I see them right now. The challenges we face in the East and the South are long term. We don't have the luxury of focusing only on one direction. We have to address both. And our responses need to demonstrate strategic resolve for the long term as well. So this conference is asking a very stark question. Can Central Europe be defended? 
My answer is clear and quite emphatic. Uh, yes, it can be defended. Central Europe and all of NATO Europe can and will be defended, just as NATO has defended Europe and the transatlantic space for 66 years. But it's going to take a lot of work to, to, to make that true in the long term, and I hope uh, this conference will focus uh, attention on the, uh, the, the urgency of these issues as we uh, deal with probably the most dangerous security situation that I can remember uh, in our wider European neighborhood. So thanks very much. I look forward to uh, responding to your questions. Um, Ambassador, I would be very grateful if you could comment on the situation in eastern Ukraine as far as uh, NATO's assessment goes. Uh, uh, how do you see Russian participation in rebel actions there at the moment? And uh, do you think the threat of a next incursion or flare-up in flights uh, is imminent? Thank you very much. Well, we will... Uh judge the Russians by their actions more than their words. Uh, so far, we've, no, we've not seen as much uh, effort to get their, their separatists, to get the separatists, the Russians' proxies in eastern Ukraine, to fully implement the uh, Minsk Accords. The ceasefire has not been fully honored, and uh, the, there's been more and more violations majority of which are the responsibility of the separatists in recent weeks. Uh, there's never been uh, access sufficient for the OSCE to monitor uh, the withdrawal of heavy weapons, and there's growing evidence that those weapons are back on the front lines being used against uh, the government forces. Uh, so I don't know whether there's going to be another large offensive or whether it's going to be just continued uh, low-level uh, attacks. But, uh, but we were still waiting to see whether the Russians are truly serious about uh, f fully implementing the Minsk agreements. And uh, I think the Ukrainian side, while it's, there may be some problems on its side, has been uh, doing its best to launch these four working groups under the Trilateral Contact Group, which are the vehicle for implementing all the different aspects of Minsk, the security, economic and political aspects. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll see some genuine improvement uh, in, the, in the coming days and weeks. But, uh, but the jury is still out. Uh, Secretary of State Kerry reported that the Russians uh, emphasized their commitment to Minsk in word, but we're waiting to see whether that is borne out in deed. Do you think this conflict could have been avoided if Ukraine had got membership of NATO in 2008? Wasn't it a mistake not to offer membership for Ukraine and maybe for Georgia? Okay. Well, it's always dangerous for a, an official to uh, respond to a hypothetical. Uh, we, we don't know what uh, would have happened had this different decisions been taken, but of course, uh, after the Bucharest summit decision in 2008, the Ukrainian government uh, adopted a non-bloc policy, uh, and uh, NATO accepted that. The position of NATO always is that it's up to each country to decide whether it wants to pursue a relationship with the alliance or whether it wants to pursue a different course. Uh, so the efforts by Russia now to claim that it was somehow uh, Ukraine's uh, determination to join NATO that justified its aggression, uh, both the annexation of Crimea and the aggression in eastern Ukraine, simply does not hold water. Uh, but I think now we have to deal with the situation it is. I don't think uh, speculating on how things might have played out under different scenarios uh, is uh, all that helpful. But we're doing what we can to support Ukraine. Uh, We've established a number of trust funds to give, give assistance in areas like command and control and logistics and cyber defense. Several of NATO's member states are providing uh, defensive uh, support to Ukraine. And uh, we hope that, that uh, th there can be a political solution based on the Minsk agreements. But as I said, uh, the jury is out on whether Russia genuinely wants to, uh, to go down that road. I think uh, Hungary's best uh, guarantee of its security is to be a, a strong
strong uh, member of NATO. Uh, NATO provides the security guarantee for Hungary, and uh, I think that we're seeing actually a renewal of hung Hungarian uh, involvement in the readiness action plan, in uh, strength contributing to the strength and collective defense of the alliance. I think our best uh, strategy for dealing with uh, a revisionist Russia that's putting pressure on its neighbors is uh, to, to close ranks, to strengthen the unity of the alliance, and to show that we uh, will defend every ally against any threat. And at the same time, as I said in my remarks, we have to do what we can to help the Russia's neighbors withstand the kind of pressure that they face. Uh, that's a little bit harder than uh, protecting uh, our own uh, countries who have the benefit of an Article 5 guarantee. But I think that it's uh, critically important that we not uh, concede to the vision of a Europe based on new dividing lines and, and spheres of influence that uh, Russia is trying to put forward, but insist that uh, sovereign nations have the right to make their own, uh, their own decisions. And I think ultimately that creates a safer neighborhood for, for Hungary, uh, which may indeed be a frontline state in a lot of different uh, senses of the term, but uh, the more stable your neighbors are, the more secure Hungary will be. I think that uh, allies have, uh, in, in our discussions since this crisis began, have uh, reaffirmed many times that we still need to pursue all three of these core tasks that we set out in our strategic concept five years ago. Perhaps collective defense has become primus inter pares uh, among the three, but, uh, but we have to be prepared for crisis management. We don't know what kinds of crises or challenges on our periphery may come up. Uh, we have to be able to move forces and, and conduct operations. But I think there's also a recognition that cooperative security may be even more relevant today than it was in the past in terms of a preventive strategy that we need to use uh, defense capacity building, all of our different programs aimed at interoperability with partners to help them strengthen their own capacity to uh, provide stability in their neighborhoods or to contribute to broader regional and international uh, efforts. So uh, I emphasize in my remarks helping to strengthen the capacity of, uh, of our eastern neighbors, but there may be even more uh, opportunities, although it will take a lot of resources to do it in a serious way, serious way but it, there may be more opportunities to work with some of our Middle Eastern partners in North Africa, uh, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, to help, uh, help them help themselves, in a sense, by, by uh, working with them to build their defense capacity. Uh, in the process, we also ensure we continue to have a broader coalition in waiting in the event that we do have to do a crisis management operation. Uh, remember that in Afghanistan, we, uh, in addition to the 28 allies, we had at one point another 24 countries contributing to the operation. So partnerships can help us, but I think the key now is to help our partners uh, avoid becoming failed states, to have the institutions and the, uh, and the, and the security capacities to, uh, to, to deal with terrorist threats, to deal with uh, instability, and to... Uh, prevent the spread of, uh, of ISIL and other violent extremist groups uh, that are beginning to threaten, uh, threaten them all. So uh, as I, again, we do a lot of this, but on a relatively small scale. We set up our partnerships with the Mediterranean countries and with the Gulf countries starting in the 1990s when things were much quieter and it was not as much of a strategic imperative. Uh, now, uh, the, there's still a debate on this, but I think now a, a much more seriously resourced effort at defense capacity building, which could include cooperation with some of the regional institutions like the African Union, Arab League, the GCC, as well as with individual states, could uh, make an important difference in uh, stabilizing our neighborhood. Right now we are doing focused defense capacity building with, uh, with Jordan and uh, with Georgia. We're uh, discussing with uh, Moldova an expanded program. We're also looking to uh, contribute to the coalition against ISIL through a small defense capacity building program with Iraq. Uh, but there are other uh, countries that are, are interested, Morocco, Tunisia, Mauritania, where we could also uh, be helpful. 
So, uh, so cooperative security is uh, definitely high on our radar screen. And uh, I think at the Warsaw Summit, we hope to show that we're using all of our tools to try to contribute to more stable eastern and southern neighborhoods, uh, uh, recognizing that we're in a very long-term, uh, a period of long-term challenge that uh, will require a long-term approach. My uh, first question uh, regarding to the defense of the Baltic states. The Baltic states repeatedly ask NATO to, to deploy uh, permanently NATO brigade on their own territory. Do you think that uh, there is any, any chance to, cha to change the decision taken by the NEC in, uh, in uh, last year uh, in uh, Wales? Second question dealing with the NATO strategic concept. Uh, there are views that, uh, in light of the events, crisis, Ukraine crisis, there is a need to amend or to change uh, NATO strategic concept in relation with Russia. Do you think it will take place uh, uh, quickly or takes time longer? Thank you very much. Well, on the first question, uh, we are, as I said, uh, deploying on a, what we were calling a persistent rotational basis uh, NATO forces in uh, all of the Eastern Allies uh, through this, both through these NATO force integration units, the small command and control and logistics uh, hubs, and also through uh, almost uh, uninterrupted rotational exercises that are taking place led by uh, the United States and many other allies. So there is a presence uh, of a rotational character, but it's 24-7 in, in the Baltic states and other Eastern allies. Whether to uh, go beyond that, uh, maybe uh, something we'll be discussing in the coming weeks and months, but I think that the consensus remains that uh, our strategy should be based on a, an effective and credible ability to reinforce quickly in a crisis. Uh, and fundamentally, that depends on having this very high readiness joint task force and follow on forces that can come in even behind that uh, to ensure that uh, we meet any aggressor uh, before uh, uh, they, they can uh, make any significant advance. And of course, the whole idea of this is, is deterrence. So uh, I think we have, we have a strategy that provides forward presence, but backed by a very serious reinforcement plan. And I think. The key now from now until Warsaw, in, until Warsaw is to fully implement uh, that strategy. On the strategic concept, uh, allies have uh, generally concluded that although the, the description of the nature of our relationship with Russia in the strategic concept is clearly uh, uh, overtaken by recent events uh, because the strategic concept speaks of a relatively benign relationship characterized by partnership with Russia, but that the bulk of the document is still, uh, still relevant, it still describes the full spectrum of threats that we have to deal with, including terrorism and violent extremism in our southern neighborhoods, uh, and puts the emphasis on these three core tasks of collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. So, uh, at least at this stage of the game, uh, there's no uh, strong push to uh, revise the strategic concept beyond the recognition that those, f those paragraphs about Russia may need uh, a little bit of updating. This, you know, this will be something that we'll be looking at between now and the Warsaw Summit, but, uh, but it, it, proved, it has proven to be a pretty uh, in, durable document in uh, describing the challenges and, and setting the tasks that the Alliance needs to perform. My name is George Sapari. I'm a returning ambassador from Washington, D.C. My question is, how early, how early did the policymakers in the Pentagon, State Department, the White House, realize that Putin is in it for something else, for and maybe extending its territory? Well, I can't speak for all the different uh, colleagues and experts. Uh, but certainly there were many, uh, many warning signs that we maybe didn't pay close enough attention to. Even when I was ambassador in the first term of President Putin, 
there were some ominous statements that uh, seemed to uh, convey this message we hear now very, very uh, continuously, not only from the political leadership but from the propaganda machine, that uh, the U.S. and NATO are uh, looking to uh, attack Russia, to dismember Russia, to weaken Russia, to deprive Russia of its role in the world. We heard some of that even uh, back in the early days, and uh, I did what I could, but obviously not enough, to try to counter that in my public speaking when I was ambassador. Uh, because I genuinely think that it's in the, in the West's interest to have a strong democratic Russia that is a contributor to a global rules-based security order. But that kind of Russia seems to be a more and more distant prospect. But we had other warning signs with the famous speech to the Munich Security Conference in 2007, I think it was. Uh, and then there was the war in Georgia. And I do re I remember, I was reminded, in fact, thanks to WikiLeaks, that I visited uh, Georgia in 2009, uh, a year after the war, and uh, President Saakashvili uh, told me, uh, watch out, Crimea is next. <laughs> and I guess that was brushed aside as, uh, as uh, delusional. But uh, now we know that it was in the, uh, in the uh, at least in the contingency plans all along. So I think we have missed many of the warning signs, but I don't think that means uh, we should blame ourselves. Uh, Russia has, uh, you know, without justification, violated just about every principle one can think of in terms of the European security system, changing borders by force for the first time since the, uh, you know, the end of uh, World War II, and uh, going against all the measures that we agreed upon to improve transparency, transparency and predictability. Uh, now seeming to prefer to create instability and create unpredictability and, and uh, tensions. Uh, and uh, we have to rise to this challenge. The real added value of Hungary and uh, all the democracies of Central and Eastern Europe that had joined the ranks of the alliance starting in 1999, and I'm wearing my hung Hungar Hungarian accession tie today, just to... Uh, to to show my true belief, belief in NATO enlargement. Uh, but I think the addition of uh, countries who have had to fight over the years for their own freedom brought strength and spirit to the alliance, and I think it's made us a stronger organization. Many said that as we added members, everything would become diluted and we couldn't make decisions. It would become uh, just a talk shop. But in fact, I think NATO has shown it, that it can rise to the challenge, and I think the uh, admission of uh, new members who know what freedom is about uh, has made an important and positive difference for the Alliance, and I think it'll help us in the current uh, period of, uh, of great challenge that lies ahead, and I hope Hungary will continue to play a strong and active part in uh, getting us back on the track of a Europe whole free and at peace that uh, uh, Hungary can celebrate with the 1999 membership in NATO and uh, the subsequent membership in the European Union. But, so thanks for your comments and thanks to all for the good questions.